If we go back a little bit to the digitalization of uh, healthcare, I mean, looking at the statistics, it's admirable. You know, um, you achieved close to 90% adoption of electronic medical record systems, and a lot of facilities managed to transition from stage six to stage seven um, on the HIMS scale of uh, the healthcare digitalization. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I still Fantastic. wonder, mm -hmm. one thing that was really interesting to me was um, kind of the research done by Interlink that says that even though, you know, the IT systems are there, basically hospitals are facing um, many similar issues than other countries, which is that you can uh, implement a system, but you also need to invest very much into the support of the users, into the maintenance of the system. Systems, and that's a challenge also here. So, uh, you know, from that perspective, how user-friendly is IT to doctors in Taiwan? Okay. Um, well, actually, uh, what you're getting to, into is exactly the problem. Um, we, we are seriously under-invested for the IT system in the hospital. And so, so user interface is not the only problem. Because of the underinvestment, we have a huge problem on information security. You know, the system are not safe at all. If you have a group of hackers, you know, who's dedicated, uh, it's quite easy to break into a hospital system because they just don't have enough money you know, they invested quite a amount of money in, in building the database, the, the electronic house record and all that, but they don't have money to spare um, to invest in the information security. And also the user interface, that's, that's another problem. Um, but it's also because of underinvestment. You know, the banking, the banking system, in the banking industry, they invested about 10% of their revenue into the IT system. On the healthcare industry, in Taiwan, we invested only like 1%, 1 to 1.5% of the revenue into the hospital, into the IT system. And in the US, it's about 3%. Um, in the Europe, they're aiming for 5%, but the most most countries and most hospitals don't have that. Yeah. So, yeah, and so okay. banking, but you can say bank is very important because they handle money, right? But now we already know healthcare information is more important than money. If you don't have healthcare, you don't have, you have nothing. So money has become no issue. Um, so you, are, you are imagine, oh, the banking system is very complex, right? So they invested a lot. But actually from the software companies that I work with, Healthcare system is 10 times more com complex than banking system. But they only invest like one-tenth, right, 10% of the money, but they're 10 times more complex than the uh, banking system. That's why the user interface of the hospital system looked like a child's play, <laughs> because you don't have enough money to afford a good interface designer, you know, user experience expert and all that. You only have money to get the function done and that's it. So mm -hmm. it's all about underinvestment. It's not that, you know, IT people who's doing hospital are stupid or what. It's not about that. It's about them not invested enough. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that always makes me wonder how are we going to realize all the potentials of AI knowing the low investments in IT? You know, so before starting to complain about this challenge, I would rather hear a little bit more about the kinds of research that you did 
in terms of AI. So we talked a little bit about the challenges with the user interface. One huge issues are the alerts that uh, doctors get when they use decision support systems. We know that they ignore 90 to 96 yes. percent of them because there's just too many. And you actually did some <laughs> research about trying to kind of uh, categorize uh, alerts so the doctors don't get too many, right? Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I'm also a clinician, so I also see patients twice a week, three times a week. Um, alert, or, or sometimes people call it uh, reminders. Okay, it's the, usually it's a pop-up dialogue that stop you from doing things. And, and you have to read and, and you say, okay, or now, okay, or whatever response you, you, you have. Um, it's something we love and hate. Uh, and, and, you know, as doctors, we hate them like 99% of the time and, and we love them like 1% or 0.5% of the time when, when they get, got it right. We love it. But when they got it wrong, it's a total waste of time, right? So every time when I get this alert, I was angry inside for three seconds, you know, and then after I came back, I kind of forget what I was doing with the patient, you know. <laughs> And I have to rethink everything. So, um, of course, after like 20 years, the three seconds become like 0 0.3 seconds. But still, it's uh, uncomfortable that when you're doing something with full concentration and a lot of brain activity, and then suddenly there's a, there was a stop sign and tell you things that's, that's really not important at all, right? Um, like a stop sign saying you should stop at a stop sign, right? That's totally useless, um, but still you have to stop and look at this, what the sign says. It says stop and stop sign, but it's still useless. So anyway, um, uh, the reminders problem is, and you know, in the hospital I'm working with, um, and as you described, the paper we just published, uh, the, the physicians received 2 million reminders in eight months. Okay. Okay, and it's not even a huge hospital. It's a hospital with like 300, 400 physicians. And, they, and, and together they received 2 million reminders only in eight months. Okay, and if you count that, you know, like every reminder stopped the physician from doing their job for three seconds. And you, you, you multiply that by 2 million, you know, that's 6 million seconds. It's a lot of physician time and it's quite expensive. So our alerting system is actually making hospital losing money because they're wasting, you know, precious physician time. That's why we did a study and, and, and we want to optimize, you know, um, what alerts should and should not be there. And the reason the alerts is the reminders or the alerts are what they are today is because the one who design each alerts, they don't care about physicians. They only care about themselves. <laughs> For example, if a pharmacy department decided to do a drug drug interaction alerts, okay, that's when we did, I mean, I went through the whole process. Back in 2007, we decided we want to have a full-blown drug-drug interaction alerts in our hospital. And I was the CIO. So we look at the drug-drug interaction textbook and there was 12,000 different drug-drug interactions. Imagine implement all that 12,000 drug-drug interaction or DDI into our system. Then the physician will get reminders like, you know, 10 reminders every, Every 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 time, you know, every temptation, they get a hundred reminders. It, it will be totally infeasible. So I I discuss with the pharmacy department. Let's look at among the twelve thousand, how many are clinically significant. You know, nobody even asked the question whether it's clinically significant. It's textbook significant. So academically, it's significant. But how many are clinically significant? And and then after a while, they came back to me and say, oh, about. 700 are clinically significant, you know, out of 12,000. And then I asked them how many of the 700 
can happen in a hospital because we don't have all the drugs in the world, right? Some of the drugs we don't even carry. They say about 400, okay? And then I ask them, among the 400 clinically significant drug drug alerts, how, uh, what happened the most frequent? Okay, they tell me, oh, uh, one of the most frequent interaction is potassium, uh, is detoxing uh, and detoxing and uh, uh, diuretics. So if detoxing is the digitalis for heart problem, diuretics is a drug for helping uh, urination of the patient, okay? If you put these two types of drugs together, it's very likely that you will suffer low potassium level, which is uh, electrolyte, right? Potassium level. So you will suffer from hypopotassium. But if you, or, or hypokalamia, that means potassium level in the blood is low. So, so always we've got to learn hypokalamia, right? And I ask them, if we implement that BDI, that alert, how many alerts are we going to get? They say, oh, uh, hundreds or thousands per month. And I asked them, who gets the, who will get the alert? They say, cardiologists. So I called the cardiologist and I said, guys, don't you know that digitalis and diuretics together will cause hypokalemia? They say, of course we know. Then I asked them, why are you still doing it? They said, of course, we add potassium to uh, to our orders, to our prescriptions. If we prescribe digitalis and diuretics, we will add potassium to the patient. Then I said, oh, yeah, we didn't know that. You know, we, didn't, we did not check that. We only look at the prescription and say, you have digitalis, you have diuretics, alert you, right? But they already are saving it by adding potassium to their prescription to the patient. So for them, it's a safe, totally safe order. But for the pharmacy department, it's a very dangerous structural interaction, right? So that's the problem why so many alerts are useless because from the pharmacy department, from their perspective, it's dangerous. So I have to remind you. Right. From the clinicians, we already know that and we are already compensate for that right so mm -hmm. i call that tunnel vision so yeah. everybody's using tunnel vision to do the alerts and they're all siloed and they don't talk to each other and they don't even talk to clinicians you know so that's the problem yeah so so in this case basically the system would only look at kind of binary relationships between drugs and it wouldn't really check if that was mitigated in any way. So I guess that's where AI can come in. What's kind of the, the most promising solutions that you're seeing or hoping to see in terms of making decision support more uh, useful for the prescribers? Okay, that's a very good question because I asked the pharmacy department to continue the story. Why don't you, you know, ask the IT people to check on the, uh, the potassium, uh, you know, level of the patient or to check on in a prescription whether we have potassium. If we have that, then you do not show the alert, right? You don't do not show the alert. They said, it's not our business to check that. Our business is to check whether they're DDI. Uh, our business is not to check whether they are potassium or not. So I said, what? You know, and... So you mentioned AI. It's not just AI. It's also the perspective of looking at all the dimensions, all the different modality or sources of data when you are making a decision support. So whenever you want to shoot an alert or you want to trigger an alert, make sure the logic behind the alert already consider all the aspect of all the data not, just, not because I'm one department, I'm only seeing my, my own data, right? If I'm the lab department, the clinical uh, pathology, I only look at lab. So I will alert you whenever the lab is, is not uh, within the normal range, right? For example, I'll give you another example. A internal medicine doctor complained. I always got this alert for liver function, okay? All my patient has a has an abnormal liver function, so I get the alert. And I said, what's wrong with that, right? It's abnormal, so you, you get the alert. He said, no, 
I'm a TB tuberculosis expert. All my patients are on TB drugs. And of course, their liver function will be abnormal. It's normal for us that their liver function are abnormal. So I don't need the alert, right? So I asked the lab department, the clinical pathology, can you check on you know, the drug when you try to alert liver function abnormality? They said, no, it's not our job to check on the drug. We only look at lab, right? So again, um, for every alert, we have to look at multi dimension narrative or multi sources of, of data. You have to consider the whole you know, patient electronic surgery. And that became a challenge also for, it's not only for the clinical department, it's also for the IT department that they don't know how to do it because there is no traditional IT methodology that can handle multi dimensional data, like hundreds of variables. For them, it's very for the traditional IT is very difficult, but AI solved the problem. You know, AI, especially machine learning based AI, they're very capable of handling uh, high dimension of variables, like, you know, 20, 30, 100, 200, thousands of variables. They could actually handle millions of variables if you want. So I think um, there are several things that needs to be done. One, the clinical department has to look at more different source of data. But usually that's kind of getting out of their expertise. You know, they're expert in lab, they're expert in medication, but they're not expert in diseases or, you know, other things. That's why they don't want to get out of their comfort zone. But anyway, they have to get out of the comfort zone and they have to look, really look at all the data. And the second thing is IT department has to know how to adopt new AI methodology that could handle multi-dimensionality of variables.